Um, hey, beautiful lady, how you doing? Good evening. So good to see you in God's house tonight. I hope you are happy to get out of that heat. Come in here to a nice air-conditioned uh, sanctuary. I see some have their blankets, uh, but uh, I know Sunday it was hot in here, and it just wasn't the Holy Spirit hot either. It was temperature hot, but uh, we had an awesome service Sunday. Uh, we took in eight more members Sunday, which was a blessing. Uh, do have a couple prayer requests tonight that's already been called in. Um, Kenny Elmore Sr., that's Kenny Elmore Jr.'s dad, uh, he's in the emergency room. They took him from National Health Care today. He's having some kidney issues. His kidney are, kidneys are not functioning right now, so please be praying for them. They were on their way to the hospital just a while ago when they called me. Also be praying for my mother. She got eight shots in her lower back, and uh, she's having some issues. Can't sit long, can't stand up long. She's... So just pray for her for comfort through this. And, uh, and pray for my dad also because he's got to take care of her. And sometimes with, uh, with mamas, you know, they know what they want. They want it right then. And, and you know, daddy just stays out in the shop. He wants to go out there. So, so uh, but anyway, uh, any prayer requests tonight? Spoken. Prayer requests tonight. I'll have to Okay. Yes, please remember Brother Ron. Yes, any more? Yes. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am, we sure will. Um, any more spoken request? Remember my mom. Yes. Okay. Yes, ma'am. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. so yes, him. yes, we'll remember him. And those that are trying to take care of him, because it's tough through that, no doubt. Any unspoken requests tonight? There, there's one that I want to voice, uh, and, and it should be our number one request across the board, lost souls of our community. We've got lost souls in our community that unless we reach out, uh, they may not come to know Jesus Christ if we don't be the hands and feet of Jesus, showing the love of God to this community and the neighborhoods you live in. So I, I pray that we will have a special anointing uh, during this last half of the year um, to minister to the lost souls that are in our communities, okay? And, uh, and just remember our brothers and sisters in Christ in other denominations. They're going through some battles in the Methodist Church and in the Presbyterian Church over certain issues that are coming to their general assemblies. There, uh, 130 churches was the number. Now it's more than that initially broke loose from the Methodist Church over uh, same-sex marriage, transgenderism in the pulpit, and so on. That was 130 churches pulled out at one time. Uh, now there's more than that. But I'll tell you the, the dilemma where these folks, like in one of the churches downtown Greenville, a Methodist church there, I was talking to one of the members uh, there. He said that they pulled out, but the Methodist uh, General Assembly, so to speak, or their governing bodies said, okay, but it's going to cost you $4 million if you want to stay in this sanctuary. So that's, now a lot of these folks that go to these churches that believe what the Bible says about these issues, they don't want to be part of something that's not upholding the Word of God, but now the pressure's being put on them. Four million dollars that they have to come to stay in the church that a lot of them grew up in and raise their families in just over this issue. So we need to lift those brothers and sisters up in Christ on both sides of the fence, not just one side, both sides because they need a touch from the Lord also. And so if we would, let's just stand tonight. And let's go to God and just pray like you were the only person in the room. 
tonight, okay? Dear Heavenly Father, we come before you. You've heard all the requests that have been given in. You know the ones that were unspoken. Lord, we just petition your throne of grace tonight. We know that you have an answer if we'll just hear it. Lord, I pray over each and every person that's here, the ones that have broken heart, the ones that are physically ailing, those that are mentally stressed, those that are financially in a bad place. Lord, I pray that you would minister through the power of the Holy Spirit right now to them. Reach down into each and every situation, Lord, and touch them. Those that are in the hospital, Lord, I pray that you would touch them. Those that are in these different denominations going through this turmoil, Lord, I pray that you would touch both sides of the fence because it is a wonderful thing to be in unity in the house of the Lord. Lord, I pray that you would bring unity back. But Lord, your standard is still holiness and righteousness. It will never go away. That's the standard for your children. Lord, I pray that the conviction power of the Holy Spirit would work in these situations, but also that the compassionate power of the Holy Spirit would work and that we would love you like you tell us to in your word by obeying your commands. Lord, I love you, I honor you, and I give you praise in advance for what you're already doing things you're doing that we don't know about. You're fighting for us. You're working on our behalf. Lord, I believe healing is coming to someone right now as we pray. I believe mental stress is leaving right now as we pray. I, I believe depression is fleeting from the heart and mind of those that are sinking in depression right now as we pray because we petition the Most High, the Creator, who created all things for Him and by Him. Lord, we love you, we honor you, and we give you praise for it in advance. In Jesus' wonderful name. And the church said amen. 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 You can be seated. Brother Ryan, we'll be in chapter 9. We're going to be in verse 14. We're going to try to close out uh, this chapter tonight. Uh, no snickers, please. Um, you know, I, when I get on a scripture, I can stay there a long time. But... Uh, but we'll be in verse 14 of chapter 9. And, uh, but first, it's been a couple weeks. You know, we had camp meeting, and then we had a, our, our council meeting last week. So, uh, so it's been a couple weeks since we... So I want to go back and review something, uh, some things with you in chapter 9. You remember Romans chapter 9, I told you that this was the, uh, this was the, the chapter that those that believe in Calvinism, teach, and this is their main chapter that they teach and preach predestination from. This is the foundation of it right here. This is where they, they get a lot of their, their scriptures that they go to. Some of it out of context, no doubt, as we read. You remember I was speaking uh, last week, and I, I told you I believe in predestination. And I seen, I mean, not last week, several weeks ago, and, and some people looked at me like a, a deer in the headlight or a cow looking at a new gate. And, and that's the same way that I would look when somebody tells me that, because I want to know what they base it off of. So I believe in the predestined humanity. I believe that humanity was predestined to be saved by God, not just an elect few, not a select few, not a choice few, but all huma humanity was predestined to be saved. But there's something in that that we get to do. He chose us from the very foundations of the world, the Bible talks about. The redemption plan was always in the mind of God. Jesus was always there. The Bible says that he is the lamb slain before the foundations of the world. So it was already a plan. It was already there. But we have a choice. We get to choose. The Bible says choose you this day whom you will serve. The Bible also tells us that salvation is not complete until we get on that side of this side. Till we cross over, our salvation will be complete. When we see him, we shall be like him, glorified in all of our ways. But I believe predestined means this. I believe predestination is God's predestined purpose, not his predestined elect. Okay? Because I, I would ask anybody 
who would say, this is not an argument or a debate. This is just scriptural. And, and I would ask anybody, and I do ask them, when they tell me they believe in an election, a predestined election of God for who can be saved, I ask them, I said, then why do you even go to church then? Why do you even tell anybody? Well, because, I said, how do you know that you are the elect? Well, I said, so in other words, you're telling me you're just wishing on a star. I said, I want to be honest with you. I know that he died for me. And I made my election very clear at the foot of the cross at an old-fashioned altar when I not only confessed, but I got up and walked away in repentance. I know that I am in his will, but I also know that all humanity has fallen short of the glory of God, and thus we needed a Savior to go to Calvary to shed his blood as a perfect, spotless lamb to give his life blood for us that we could be atoned for, our sin could be atoned for, and our healing. I said, I go to church because the Bible says it is a wonderful thing to be in unity with brothers and sisters in the Lord. And also, Hebrews 10, 25 says, Forsake not the assembling of yourself, for it's the custom of some. So much more as you see the day approaching. I said, I go to church because it's a command from the Word of God to go to church. And I also go to church because it helps my emotional state. It helps my physical state. It helps the way I carry myself. It helps in every area of my life when I get around people who are going the same direction that God has me yoked to. I'm not going in circles. I'm going straight ahead. And the more I walk with God's people, the greater blessing I see in my life and the peace that I have that no amount of money can buy. I said, I don't go just wishing I'll make it to heaven. I believe I can be secure in the blood of the Lamb. It's not, oh, I hope he picks me. It's not like we're on a, on a team. You know, when you were uh, growing up, you know, we had these out in the neighborhood. We'd have teams, and you'd have always the good folks, and you'd have some that they were just all for it playing ball. I mean, they couldn't catch, they couldn't run, they couldn't swing a bat, they definitely couldn't throw a football, and, and, uh, and you was like, yeah, my mama said I had to let them play, and I don't want her looking out the window seeing this little guy not being able to play, or, or this little young lady not being able to play, so, you know, so, and then you'd divvy up teams, and, and always the same ones. One time, they just wanted to be picked before being last. One time. But it never happened growing up because you always pick the best first. And then uh, and you would say, like, they'd be saying, pick me. See, that's the way that would feel to me. If I was thinking that there was just only a choice few that God would hand pick. I know what the Bible says. The Bible says many are called, but few are chosen. But the chosen ones are those that he has chosen, I believe, according to the Scripture, chosen to do the fivefold ministry. What is the fivefold ministry? Apostles, prophets, evangelists, teachers, and pastors. The book of Ephesians tells us what they are. That's the fivefold ministry. But every, each and every one in humanity has been called. Called to what? Called to the foot of the cross. Everyone. The Holy Spirit. The Bible even says that Jesus says, he told his disciples. He said, you see all these things happening? The end is not yet. They said, well, when will the end be? He goes on to tell them, when everyone, everyone has an opportunity. People say, well, what about the saints of old? Well, they had an opportunity. You know how it happened? The Bible says when Jesus died on the cross, he went down to where? Death, hell, and the grave, and he goes up to the gate. He goes up to the gate where Sheol is, upper and lower Sheol, paradise and purgatory. He goes up to the gate and he hears a sound. And he says, let the king of glory in. And from the other side of the gate, it said, who is this king of glory? And Jesus says, I, the one that's high and lifted up, 
I am the king of glory. And he goes through the gate. The Bible says he set the captive free. In other words, the old prophets, the old that had spoke about a Messiah coming but never seen him, never really got to see him in, in, in what he was doing. But they believed they died just like everybody else. That beggar that the Bible says the angel escorted it in to Abraham's bosom. He was there. He got a chance to see Jesus, see the finished work of the cross, and got a chance to say, okay, that is the Messiah. I believe in him. And guess what the Bible says? He led them out. So everybody, everybody who has ever set their foot on planet earth will get an opportunity to choose Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. That's scriptural. So I don't understand where some of this comes from about, Mitchell, you're the only one who can go out of your family. Now, what kind of God would do that? Let's be honest. Now, you got a beautiful family, but Mitchell, come on, leave him behind. Huh? That doesn't make sense to me. Miss Vicky. you get to go. That, the rest of that row don't get to, but you get to go. You be shouting for glory. Didn't you? Hey, see y'all. No, I'm just kidding. But but but, but Davison. What about you? You get to go, but everybody else got to be left. I mean, really? Does that look like love, mercy, and grace? No. So we get a part in it. We choose. The work, we can't work good enough to go to heaven. You know that. You understand that. It's by His love, mercy, and grace. But we get to choose this day who we're going to serve. What I have put into my life daily, I get up. No matter how I feel, I lift my hands. Say, I love you, Lord. Every morning. No matter if my stomach's hurting, my head's hurting, my feet's hurting, I'm hungry because I didn't eat supper last night. No matter what it is. I love you, Lord, and I make my mind up. I'm going to serve you today. I'm going to try to do better today than I did yesterday, not because I, I feel like you will love me more, because you'll never love me more than when I was in my mother's womb. That love is always there. It never changes. But I'm going to choose to serve you because I want to give you glory. And our service... Because we choose some things. He didn't elect us to make us robots, sister. He likes for us to choose him, and that's why the enemy hates you and me when we choose God. Because we choose it. We choose to give him glory, and that was his job in heaven, and he got fired, and he hates us because of it, because God said, watch this. The Bible says this. It says, I had created you in my presence, you're without excuse, but because you decided to steal my glory, watch what I'm going to do. And he picks up the dust from the earth and puts his lips on it and breathes the breath of life, and there was Adam. Guess what Adam was? A glorifying machine. So guess what? Humanity was predestined to give God glory. God proved that in creation. But he also proves through the free will that he gives us that we can choose to serve him every day of our life. So that brings us to this question. Verse four, I mean verse uh, 13, if you'll remember, we ended this way. It says, as it is written, Jacob I have loved, but Esau I have hated. And immediately in verse 14, we see this question that's, that Paul is asking as he's writing this. He says, what shall we say then? Is there unrighteousness with God? And then he answers and says, certainly not. Verse 15, for he says to Moses, this is what Paul is saying Quoting the scripture of old, he, say, he, says, he says to Moses, I will have mercy on whomever I will have mercy, and I will have compassion on whomever I will have compassion. Verse 16, so then it is not of him who wills, nor of him who runs, but of God who shows mercy. 
For the Scripture says to the Pharaoh, For this very purpose, you see that? For this very purpose, I have raised you up that I may show my power in you. And on whom my power in you, and that my name may be declared in all the earth. Therefore, he has mercy on whom he wills, and whom he wills, he hardens. Now let's talk about this just for a moment. Who knows the story of Pharaoh? The children, the Hebrew children. We know the story. How Moses is at a burning bush in the latter part of his 40 years serving his father-in-law. You know, 40 years he was in Egypt in bondage. 40 years he worked for his father-in-law. 40 years he was in the wilderness. So when he died. So how old was Moses when he died? He made it pretty simple. Yeah, 40, 40, 40. That's under 20. He got to do a lot of math there. Uh, but anyway, a lot of years, but there was a lot of people who lived a lot longer. 120 years he lived. But at the end of the second 40 years of his life, he approaches a burning bush. God calls him to this place. And then God handpicks him, chooses him. He had already foreordained for Moses to lead the children out. And Moses said, D -d 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 I can't speak. Most Bible scholars say he had a speech impediment or he stuttered, but God gave him a man to speak for him. And then Moses tries to throw up another excuse just like we do. He said, who shall I say is sending me? The I am. The I am is sending you. And then Moses had already lived 40 years under Pharaoh's, rule, so he, under Pharaoh's rule, so he knew the propensities of Pharaoh. He knew what kind of man he was. He knew the knowledge and the power that he had over people. He knew that he could get things done as he willed. But the Bible tells us, if you'll go read and search in that story, the Bible tells us that Pharaoh had already made up his mind what he wanted to do. So Bible say, well, the, people say, well, the Bible says that God predestined for Pharaoh. I said, no, it does not say that. It said God hardened his heart. But he hardened it because Pharaoh had already started the process. But he did not harden Pharaoh's heart for his demise. He hardened Pharaoh's heart so God's glory and power could be revealed even in somebody who said there is no God. So guess what? Paul says, remember Pharaoh. His heart was hardened. And the Bible also says, it says, therefore he has mercy on whom he has mercy and who he wills mercy to and whom he wills, he hardens. So guess what? God had a purpose, a plan. The predestined, the, pre, uh, the, the, the foreordained moment was at a purpose, not out of an election. Here it is again. It's over and over in Romans 9 how it's taken out of context to try to prove a point on one side. But the Bible, it's, I'm glad it was written for purpose. You know what that means to me and you? That God is just and fair. God is just and fair. Go to the next one, brother. You will say to me then, why does he still find fault for who has resisted his will? Go to the next one. But indeed, old man, who are you to reply against God Will the thing formed say to him who formed it, Why have you made me like this? One more. Does not the potter have power over the clay from the same lump to make one vessel for honor and another for dishonor? Now listen to this. God uses dirt. He uses the dust of the earth. He makes humanity in the Garden of Eden. 
women, y'all got it pretty good because y'all didn't get created out of just a clump of dirt. And this is where I like to plug, put a plug in for the men. Listen to me. <laughs> y'all got made out of a perfect creation. <laughs> really? I'm being honest. I know it's, it's kind of sad, but, but we love women too. Don't, don't get me wrong. We love our women here. We love our ladies. Our godly women have stood in the gap for many years. Went through the pain of bringing other glorifying machines into this world. Thank you, ladies. Thank you, Mama, because I wouldn't be here. But so, God created Adam in that Garden of Eden. And Adam had a choice. It's like the potter takes the dirt, takes the clay, makes something out of it. Maybe it's a cup or a bowl, but I've never heard a piece of clay go up to the potter and say, why did you make me a cup? I wanted to be a bowl. Or, why did you make me an ashtray? <laughs> I know when we went to a, 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 I forget what that little class was. Somebody hit me up. It was a home ec, I think. They took us, and we went to this place who had a, is it a, called a kill? A, a, a who? Yeah. See, I was just testing your knowledge. Yeah, kill, one of those. And, 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 and most of the folks make, made ashtrays in our class, to be honest with you. And here I am, a church of God, pastor's son. I said, I can't take no ashtray home with me. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, so I, made, I made a little, a little, uh, uh, a little, little bowl. I knew he wasn't going to use it for cereal because he eats out of a mixing bowl like I do. But anyway, uh, but I did make him a little bowl made out of clay. But, but I, I was reminded as I was reading through these scriptures about that, about this text here, how I didn't hear any of that stuff that was made. Ask the one who made it, why did you make me this way? And so that, that goes to some of the things that we see today. You know, a lot of people are using some cop-outs on what they have went through, and they use that for a crutch to be something that they would never purpose to be. Show his power. And I think it's just amazing that he uses something like us to reveal to this lost and dying world that God still has power and he still gets the glory in all things. But so many people... They choose things in their life and then they say, oh, he made me this way. No, he did not. You chose to be that way. Now, there's some things in your life that would cause you to go, but you still have a choice and there's nothing. God does not make robots. And I wish this world could understand that. God cannot and will not make you do anything that you... And I've, and I've heard this, brother. I've heard, well, God will kill you before he lets you die and go to hell. Not going to happen. Not going to happen. If that were the case... That's the rich man who looked across the great divide and said, just let this beggar, let him go back and tell my brothers they don't want to come here. So there again, if we could look at everything, and, and I would love for us to have tunnel vision when it comes to this, that God is purposeful. I've often wondered in my own life, why do I go through some of the things that I have? Well, maybe it was my choice. But I remember reading the scripture. God will turn what the enemy meant for evil for my good and for his glory. So in all things, no matter if it's the death of a loved one, there still can be glory to God in it. Because if that loved one had made their election and they chose to serve God, I have got to preach some of the best funerals since I've been here at Abbeville Church of God. And I'll be honest with you, it didn't feel like I was preaching a funeral. It felt like I was preaching on a Sunday morning to a congregation who was ready to hear the word of God. And it's because they had made their election. They had already predetermined 
feeling for themselves where they would end up. And it made my job easier. And I thank you all if y'all can, if you can see me today, thank you. Because it was a, it was a, a, a time that I mourn the loss of some of those folks that I love dearly that spoke into my life since I've been here. But guess what? I was joyful and a little envious because they was where I'm trying to get to. They are now where we're trying to get to. But there's glory in that. And some people say, well, I, I, listen, I've, I've been to a lot of classes, a lot of school. One thing they teach you, anytime you're dealing with Funerals or anything like that. They teach you just to kind of minister to the person. Don't be too excited. <laughs> now, I'm not going to say this is Pentecostal classes either now. But I'm, I'm, what I'm telling you is, is that's the way they teach you. That is what you go by. But, but the Bible says different. The Bible says we should mourn when a baby comes into the world and we should rejoice when a believer goes on. We do it backwards. Lord help me tonight. I'm amazed. I'm amazed that when a baby comes in the world, now not only do we have shower after shower, we have gender reveal party, we have all of this garbage. I'm sorry, not garbage. We have all of this stuff. <laughs> we have all of this stuff, and we have some of the biggest parties for a baby to be born into the sin nature of the world and have to endure all of this stuff that we're going through. And then when a believer dies, I have people say, well, I just can't get through it. Why? I don't understand. My mind won't let me go there. And I've lost. I lost the greatest woman in my life, my mama. But she's the one that instilled in our family, you serve God with every fiber of your being. Even when it gets tough, when you're in the valley, there's a lily there in the valley. The only time you're going to see the lily is when you're going through the valley. That's why he don't leave you on the mountaintop the whole time because you need to meet the lily in the valley. They, she instilled that in me. And it was a blow to our family, no doubt. But I'll never forget as my dad preached the greatest woman in his life, which was his mother-in-law, not his mama, he said. He loves his mama. She's still alive today, 90. How old, too? Great woman. Faithful tither to our church and lives in Greenville. She watches, might be watching tonight. I don't know. But as he preached that funeral, I'll never forget what he told me as a young boy. Because my grandmother, my mama, she picked me up every day from school. I went and stayed with her every day. She cooked a seven-course meal every day. All the family. They had a large family. I think my mama had like seven or eight brothers and sisters. Is that right? Yeah? Yeah? One of them's 88 now. One of her brothers. But, but anyway, they would come over every day and eat. And it was more than enough. Some of them wasn't living right, but she said she felt like every time she got and made the best biscuits in the world, I'm telling you. Hardy's ain't got nothing. Bojangles ain't got nothing on her. I'm talking about cat head biscuits. I don't know if you ever had a cat head, but a big old cat head biscuit. Someone had to have some, Sister Deborah. <laughs> I've already been told. Uh, but she said she felt like every time she would cook for people, she was giving God glory. And she would pour in. What that caused me to do, and it's right along the same lines as the potter making something, it caused me to research bread makers one time. I heard my dad mention about bread makers, and I said, I've heard this. I don't know if it's just fluff or not, but I want to get down to the meat of this thing. And what I found out when you, when you, when you look at bread makers... People who make really good biscuits. Because it's amazing to me that you can give your recipe to Miss Lynn and I could use hers for flying saucers or, or skeet shooting contest. I'm telling you. you could, she could use 10 times as much as rising flowers you're supposed to or whatever you're supposed to use in it and they still would be flat, wouldn't they? Like yeah, like a hockey puck, she said. I did it. And I wondered why. I said, well, my... Some of my family members has got my mama's recipe. So why ain't they the same? And people say, well, well just because she knew what she was doing. It's got to be something more than that. What I found out, bread makers who are really good have a certain type of oil in their skin. 
And every time you put your hand in that dough and you knead it, ain't that what you call it, kneading the dough? Every time you mix something together, it receives, I'm fixing to preach right here in a minute, I'm telling you, it receives something from the Creator, the Maker of the bread. When God reached down, when he reached down and he picks up the dirt out of the ground and he created mankind, they got something from the, the maker, the potter, into the clay, and it's something that's always going to be there. We just get to choose to activate it in our life, and we do that by raising our hands and giving God glory. We do that in the worst times of our life that we say, I know the peace speaker in the middle of the storm. I know he still speaks, speaks peace to me, and sometimes he doesn't make the storm go away, but in the middle of the storm, I'm just as cool, cool as a cucumber, and I'm calm. You know why? Because there's some royal DNA in me and you. Now you can choose. You can choose to say, Potter, here I am. Make me for your purpose. Make me for your glory. At times, guess what? You as a human being are going to dishonor God. The Bible tells us that. For all, all, somebody say A-L-L. -L. What does that spell? Oh. You sure? Oh. Sure? You sure, Facebook? Then why in the world do some of us put on our self-righteous jackets and walk around like you ain't ever done nothing wrong? If the Bible says all have fallen short of the glory of God, but aren't you glad he thinks enough of his creation that he made a way where there seemed to be no way. He made a way for us to get back to that relationship just by him putting his hands purposefully on something and giving us a plan to come out on the other side victorious. That blows my mind. Still today it blows my mind. Because a lot of years I played church. A lot of years I said I was, but I didn't live what I said. And I will never forget my father telling me as a teenager, probably about 19 or 20, I was called to preach at 17. Called to preach at 17 years old. Answered a call a little over 10 years after that. But those 10 years, ooh, I, I'll never forget my dad telling me one day, God has made you for a purpose. And I'm thinking, wow. Hopefully it ain't the purpose that I'm doing right now. Hope this ain't what he made me to do. And he said, just remember this, son. That calling on your life is without repentance. I mean, you can't turn and walk away from it. But also remember this, every time, and this goes for all of us, not just people who are called to minister, because we're all called to give Him glory. Every time you willfully sin outside of that plan, guess what the Bible says? You put Jesus back on the cross to open shame. Wow. But you know what? The creator, the potter. In that moment, he don't love us any less. He loves us just the same because he has purpose. And until the last opportunity, the last opportunity in this life that we have, the last breath we take, his purpose will still be there awaiting you to step into it. People say, well, Pastor, I don't know about that. I know people got saved early in life. They've been good people. They, they've lived for God. They always went to church. They ministered to people. And then and I've seen, I, and I, I had a guy just a couple weeks ago say, I don't know if I believe in a deathbed experience of salvation. I said, why? I said, you ever read the story of the three crosses? And there was one that was condemned to die right beside him. And what did Jesus tell him? This day you will be with me in paradise. He got a chance to receive Jesus Christ as his Lord and Savior. I said, so why wouldn't? Now, now I understand the Bible also says in, in what we call the first book, which is not really the first book written, it's Genesis. Uh, Job's the first book ever written. It's out of chronological order, but Genesis, uh, it says that 
God won't always strive with the heart of man. I understand that. And I'm very much aware of what that's talking about. Now you can come to a place in your life where you turn over to a reprobate mind. You don't want to have any knowledge of God. You don't care what anybody says about God. You shake your fist in the face of God and say, I don't care what your statutes or precepts are. But I can tell you this, his purpose never changed for that person either. It's still there. That purpose will always be there. He didn't change his plan or his purpose for us. We just got to choose to be in His will. Go to the next scripture. What if God, wanting to show His wrath and to make His power known, endured with much long suffering the vessels of wrath prepared for destruction, and that He might be known, He might make known the riches of His glory on the vessels of mercy, which He had prepared beforehand? For glory. Even us whom he called, not of the Jews only, but also the Gentiles, as he says also in Hosea, I will call them my people who were not my people, and her beloved who was not beloved. And it shall come to pass in the place where it was said to them, You are not my people. There they shall be called sons of the living God. Isaiah also cries out concerning Israel, Though the number of the children of Israel be as the sand of the sea, the remnant will be saved. For he will finish the work and cut it short in righteousness, because the Lord will make a short work upon the earth. And as Isaiah said before, unless the Lord of Sabbath, Sabaoth had left us a seed, we would have become like Sodom and we would have been made like Gomorrah. What shall we say then that the Gentiles who did not pursue righteousness have attained to righteousness, even the righteousness of faith? But Israel... Pursuing the law of righteousness has not attained to the law of righteousness. Wow. The Bible talks about here in the book of Romans chapter 9. It's around verse uh, 16, I believe. Uh, don't hold me to it, but it's around verse 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, somewhere in there. Anyway, it's, it's in there. He talks about mercy. We just read it about mercy. And one thing we must realize, Paul was trying to get the folks here to realize, is that we don't deserve mercy. We don't deserve it. He was first talking to the Jews. The Jews thought that they deserved the mercy of God because they were the seed of Abraham. Because the covenant with Abraham, the Abrahamic covenant. They thought, as we've spoken in the, the last few books of Romans, he's still dealing with some of those mindset in the Roman church here of the Jew that thought, well, I'm entitled to this because I am a Jew. You remember several weeks back we talked about the circumcision? Paul tells them, you're not a Jew because of circumcision of flesh. You are a righteous person because of circumcision of the heart. That's what it really can. And that's the, that's the Holy Spirit that does that work. He carves away at the heart of man, which the Bible says the heart of man is wicked. So he's got to carve away in the heart of man the wickedness to prepare the temple. Listen to me. That's where a lot of folks don't like this kind of preaching anymore because this is talking about sanctification, where, where he's got to prepare the temple to be filled with the Spirit of the living God. So there's work to be done. That's why he just didn't say it. He just showed up in it. He says, it's a circumcision of the heart. He's carving away, carving away, carving away. Now, let's just be honest. They've been debate for many years along the Pentecostal uh, sides of the fence about sanctification. 
Some believe it's instantaneous. Some believe it's progressive. I just want you to know your pastor was not instantaneous. Mine lasted 10 long years. There was a lot of ugly in here that had to be carved away. But I would tell you this, just like the children of Israel, as we talked about with Pharaoh, his heart hardened. The same, this is the same thing. What should have took them just a few days to get to the promised land took them 40 years. Don't ever forget that. God's purpose and plan is straight. If I would have done my part through the 10 years of sanctification, guess what? I would have arrived a lot earlier. And so would you. But it was because of my, here it goes again, choices. I've made some good choices and I've made some bad choices. But you can't serve two masters. The Bible's clear on that. It says either you will love the one and hate the other or hate the one and love the other. It's impossible. And I think most of you were here a couple of weeks ago as I was talking about an interview that I had listened to. And actually, I, I didn't even tell in that message who it was. It was actually John Bevere and uh, PTL, Jim Baker. What Jim Baker had done years ago, you know, and John Bevere goes, interviews him and and he, he, didn't had, he had to do a lot of years in prison and probation and all this stuff, you know. And John Bevere goes to the prison. He's sitting there with Jim Baker, and he asked him, he said, Jim, when did you fall out of love with Jesus? And Baker said, now, now, now what he did lasted about 12 years. The corruption was about 12 years long. There's still some people suffering because of what he did, just so you know. Jim Baker said, I didn't fall out of love with Jesus. I still love Jesus through the whole time. He said, I just quit fearing the Lord. John Bevere, later on in the interview, if you see the whole clip of it, he's like, wait a minute, I don't understand that. And, and Jim Baker goes and exhorts John Bevere in this interview about loving, the Lord, loving Jesus but not fearing God. And that triggered something in my spirit. I have seen that all my life. What does that look like? I did it a long time in my life. I love the person of Jesus that would go to the cross, shed his blood, lay his life down. I love that person. But I didn't fear God enough to walk the straight and narrow. I didn't fear God enough to let him lead me by his spirit. I didn't fear God enough to say, no, I'm not going to go to that and do that. I'm going to do what the Bible says do. I didn't fear God enough to obey his commands to show him I loved him. Because the Bible says the only way he knows is if we obey his commands. The Bible says, if you love me, obey my commands. So I thought about that in my own life. And many of you probably in the same boat with me on this situation and this issue is that we, most people in the Bible Belt love Jesus, just so you know. That's why if you go across these streets, most people tell you I'm a Christian. That's why I tell you right now. I don't care if they tell me they're a Christian or not. What I want to know is they're a disciple. Disciples follow Jesus. Christian is a name that was given by, by Constantine because he had to set up something to call some people that wasn't like them, but he seen he could make profit off of the Christian. So that's why I don't call myself a Christian a whole lot. I call myself a disciple of Jesus Christ. Because not only do I love him, but I love the Father. And I fear the Lord with a respectful fear. See, when you stop loving the potter, who makes this bowl or this cup for a purpose, then you start grumbling against the potter and you start saying, well, why did they not have to go through what I went through to get to the same place? Same argument in the parable of the vineyard. Same argument. These people standing out there, the vineyard comes by, at the third hour, the fourth hour, I mean the third, the sixth, the ninth, the eleventh, he comes by, this person is picked up, took to the vineyard, they do the work, then there's somebody at sixth hour, he picks up, goes to the work, somebody at the ninth hour, he goes by, picks up, they do the work, somebody at the eleventh hour, picks them up and they do the work. When it's at the end of the day, 
Guess what he told every one of them? He said, I'll give you one dineros for an honest day's work. Guess what? The master got to determine what the day would be, how long it would be. Okay? He paid them all the same. The ones who got paid the one denarius that didn't, didn't work, I meant uh, that worked from all day long, they got paid. They started grumbling against the ones that got paid from the 11th hour. Almost quitting time and they come. But that shows us a picture of somebody's salvation who gets saved at the end. But listen to me. That's why it's so important not to forget what the prophet Joel said. He said, I will restore back to you the years that the palmer worm and the canker worm have eaten. I will restore these back. The latter will be greater than the former and the latter together because you can do more under the unction of the power of the Holy Spirit in a short amount of time than if you would have been in this same 25, 30 years. You can do more in one year following the Spirit of God because most of the time if we have longevity in life and we've served God a long time, this is what I've seen. I love people who've been in the faith a long time, but most of the time they get to a certain point. Well, I done done all I can do. Bless God, I've been in this thing a long time. You know what the Bible says, though? It said he's coming back for those who are working for him and doing the Father's business. This is not the Father's business. Because he does not slack, he does not slumber. And what his purpose is... Paul was trying to teach this church at Rome. God is very purposeful. He has saved you. And good old Bradley and Lingo, he has saved you not to give you fire insurance. He saved you to go and give this gift of life to dead people. And they've got a choice in the matter. He goes on to talk about and it's the same way with us. Israel, Gentiles, anybody who wasn't a Jew was a dog. They called them dogs. The Samaritans were dogs. The Moabites, the Hittites, the Canaanites, the, all these tites. If they wasn't really Jews, Hebrew, Jews, they were dogs. Some of them wasn't pure. They were dogs, half-breeds they called them. Same thing went on in America, blacks and whites, blacks and Latinos. Same thing, same thing. It's all garbage, what it is. That's why I'm so glad that the Holy Spirit inspired, said there's neither Jew nor Greek. We're all one. In Christ, we're all one. Gee, let me tell you this. When it talks about, but Israel pursuing the law of righteousness has not attained the law of righteousness, guess what? They could not understand through all of that how the God that had given the, 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 the covenant to Abraham, they couldn't understand why he would give the same opportunity in grace and love and mercy to a dog. He couldn't, they couldn't understand why. That this creator would love them just as much as he loved the ones who was through the heritage and the lineage of Abraham. They couldn't understand that. So Paul had to keep reiterating this about Jews and Gentiles. Jews and Gentiles. And you'll, you'll hear it, keep hearing it throughout Romans. But it's the same thing we did. We just segregated our worship and said this is a white church or this is a black church. Same way we do with this is a more influential church. This is a... Now, we don't let those kind of people come in here that don't have their shirt tucked in as a man. I'm thinking... Or, um, we don't let them women come in here with them ear bobs on now.
We don't, uh, we don't, we don't, we don't let women come in here wearing them pants. Let me tell you something. Righteousness is not something that is seen on the outside. Righteousness is something that the Holy Spirit carves away at your heart and you know it from the inside. And if you've got it in the inside, you'll do what the Word of God said. No man in all of his legalistic mindset, which the Jews were very legalistic, no man, that's why he said they did not obtain the law of righteousness. In church, I am saddened in today's world, in the Pentecostal movement, we still got some of that ignorance that is spoke to this lost and dying world. You can come in here if you clean up a little bit. This is where they should come and want to be cleaned up once they feel the love of God from the people of God that God has foreordained and called out. I'll never forget. It's been about two and a half years ago. There was an individual coming. He sat back there on the back row and I had like five people at church. Pastor, I can smell alcohol all over him. I said, I hope he brings every friend he got back next week. He's sitting right there, redheaded. Third seat right back there. I'll never forget his face. And I'm thinking my whole time, I hope they didn't hear anybody tell me that he was drunk and alcoholic come sitting on these. I hope he didn't hear it. I hope that's not the reason why he never came back. Until we change that mindset and understand that we can attain the law of righteousness if we'll let the Spirit of God lead us. And this is another thing. While I'm on this little soapbox, just let me be just for a minute. It's early. It ain't nine yet. No, I'm just kidding. I have been in several conversations. We had council meetings in the last two weeks. If I'm not mistaken, Lynn, throw your bottle of water at me if I'm, if I'm mistaken. But please don't. <laughs> you might hit me. Uh, uh, we've had council meetings. I prayed about. We've had leadership who's leading transition leadership meetings. Uh, I think about four or five of them in the last two weeks. We've had counseling sessions, probably three or four of them in the last two weeks. We've had a lot of stuff to deal with. Uh, and every time I come out of one of them, the Holy Spirit, it's like I get a jolt of this is the vision. This is the vision. This is the vision. The house of refuge was built for this vision. This is the vision. You have kind of backed off the vision. You have done some things that, that going through the motions, you've kind of got slack. The Holy Spirit's talking to me. He ain't telling you. He's talking to me. He's saying, it's time for you to get people focused back on the vision. Back on the vision. So what we started doing, every time we met with somebody who was going to be leading the ministry, we gave them the House of Refuge program. They said, we told them, this is the vision. Everything that you do, it's got to be intentional with this vision because it's the vision that God gave me for this church. And we're going to go through with it. What does that mean? Guess what? I hope and pray that you have to give up some of your seats for some stinking people. I hope and pray you have to give up your seats for people who smell like they just walked out of one of these juke joints where they're serving Mad Dog 2020 or alcohol or whatever. I hope that you have to give up your seat where they wander off this street because the love of God is running out the door like a river of living water. I hope and pray. And I have prayed this every time. I hope and pray that we have to feed them on, on, our, on our homecoming day. I hope the people of the church don't even get to eat a chicken leg because we got so many visitors from this community that we have to feed them and we have to stand there and watch them. You know what that'll tell us? Who is truly righteous and self-righteous. And I've prayed, Lord, if they don't want to take off the coat of self-righteousness, give them a self-righteous church to go to. This is the house of the Lord. We will stand for his righteousness and that alone. And I will never turn down, never turn down one person from this community who truly needs to hear about the love of God. It's not going to happen. I have been refocused on the vision. This chapter 9, it re-energized me. It re-energized me to understand 
that he preordained, he foreordained this vessel to give God glory. And the best way to give God glory is to find somebody that don't know him. Find somebody that don't know him. Yeah, your shout's good. We're going to shout. I might do a little dance. You might do a little dance. Sister Vicky may let out a war cry. I don't know. We're going to do a little bit of that. It's all good. It's who we are. It's who God has us, and I don't want any of that to stop. People say, we're going to scare them. No, you're not going to scare them. They probably come here looking for that war cry. They probably didn't know how to cry like that. They need to see you do it. They need to see us operate and, and, and the Holy Spirit make manifest through us under the unction of the Holy Spirit because they're lost and dying and he created us. He called us out of darkness into his wonderful light to be a glorified machine telling people about the love of God. And if we don't do that, church... We're going to meet the maker one day and be in trouble. I think I talked, maybe it was Mitchell or Leslie, I don't know, maybe Carter. Might have been Carter. Me and him on the same level a lot of times. Talking, he's smarter than I am. I might have been Cameron, we were riding under, I don't know. It was, it was somebody I talked to just in the last couple of days. Might have been Sister, I don't know, might have been Sister Vicky. I don't know, we had a conversation this week, I don't know. But I know I said this. What did I say? My mind went blank. No, I said this. <laughs> Sometimes you just need to hush and say it, or you'll forget what you want to say. No, I'm just kidding. We have fun, but we love God. I said this. I said, if you knew, if you knew that you had a gift that you could give somebody who was taking their last breath, and they could live if you gave it to them, would you stand there and say, let me watch you just exhale it. Get it on that. Let me see you die. No. You would try to give it to them. That's what those are called and have answered the call. That's what we have. We have the gift of life. And there's a lot of people fixing to exhale their last breath. And we walk by them day in and day out. Because some of us truly have not attained to the law of righteousness yet. But we have put on a coat of self-righteousness. And a lot of us think, well, I've done enough. I've done enough. No. Unless, unless the fallen angel Lucifer, Satan, has got a tent outside your house, you ain't done enough yet. If he ain't beating on your door every day, if he don't know you by name, and I'll just go and say it again. I said it several times. As hard as I preach, I don't even know that he knows my name. I hadn't done enough for the kingdom for him to even recognize me yet. Neither have you. I'm just being honest. My goal in this life, Sister Deborah, on this side of glory, is that Satan himself knows the name of the redeemed one, Scott Sherfield, because he disrupts his plan so much in a lost and dying world that he knocks on 23, I'm going to tell him where I live, 2320 County Line Road, because he don't know it unless I tell him. Because he don't know, he's not all-knowing. We give him more credit. We think he's like God. He can't deal but with one person at one time, and God can deal with multiple, poor, millions, billions, eight and a half million, billion people on the earth today. He can talk to them all at one time. That's our God. But we worry about this little thing that, that we draw a picture of wearing a <laughs> horns and a pitchfork with a pointed tail running around like he's going to stick you with something. I love what Isaiah said, the prophet Isaiah. He said, when this thing's said and done, we're going to laugh at him and mock him and scoff. and said, this is the thing that gave us all this trouble? See, we haven't tapped into the power of righteousness yet. We hadn't attained the law of righteousness because greater is he that's in me than he that's in all the world. 2320, County Line Road, Bradley, South Carolina. 29819, come on down and see me because once I get to that place, I'll know that I'll know that I have done what God has chosen me to do. And I will have attained the law of righteousness in my life. No matter what it costs. I, there's, not a, there's not a scale that, that I could even weigh that would prove to me that I've done enough yet. 
until he splits those eastern sky and my body defies gravity. That's when I'll know. And I'm looking for that day. And I think it's going to be sooner than a lot of people think. So guess what? We should be expedient about fulfilling the Great Commission because the law of righteousness. Stand to your feet. You know, Paul does a great job in the book of Romans weighing out some of the hard, tough questions of the Roman church there with Jews and Gentiles in it. And a greatest job and as anointed that he was. You know, I, I need to tell somebody this because some of us are struggling with this, no doubt. Um, from the Damascus Road experience, When Paul was handpicked, God said, said, no, there was a prophet, said, I know about him, Saul. I'm scared of him. I know what he does. He kills believers. And God said, no, I have picked Paul for this perverse time. He had the experience. But from that moment, 14 years later, he finally entered into ministry. A lot of us didn't know that. Fourteen years gap from the time he was called, handpicked on the road to Damascus. A lot of us think Paul just jumped right into ministry. He had to, he had to be taught, discipled, figured out the law of righteousness. See, some of us have jumped ahead of God. He's been trying to teach us for the last 20 years the law of righteousness. We jumped ahead of God and we started doing these tasks thinking, oh, I'm pleasing God. You know, God doesn't, God doesn't wake up and see you doing a little something and say, oh, look how good they are today. Oh, man, they're doing so much good stuff today. Oh, it just makes me happy. No. That's not what the Bible says. The Bible says the heart of God is moved. When our heart breaks, for what breaks His? Let me tell you what breaks God's heart. People dying and going to hell. That's what breaks God's heart. And until you get to that place, what the prophet of old said, where is those that would weep in between the altar and the porch, the altar, the place of repentance, the porch, the people in the community, the people in the nation that were lost, until you get to that place again where you walk and you weep and you cry and you're, you're, you're spiritually distraught over somebody dying and going to hell, you're not impressing God. That's what the Scripture says. That's tough stuff. But God has a purpose for all that he's called, he has a purpose. And you're not going to do it the way I am. Sister Nikki, you're going to reach people that I can never reach. Brother Ryan, you're going to reach people that I can never reach. Sister Jean, you're going to reach people that your pastor cannot reach. But there is a purpose and a plan. Jeremiah 29, 11 says, I have a plan for you for good, not evil. And I love King James. You know I love the King James rendition of it where he gets to the end and said it has an expected end. That means the creator that reached down at the beginning of all creation, when he created humanity, when he reached down, he said, I got a plan for this dirt. I've got a plan for this dust. And at that moment, he already had an expected end for it. And guess what that is? Glory one day for each and every one of us. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, I love you. I honor you. And I give you praise. You have been better to us than we've been to ourselves, and we thank you for it. You sent your son to die at Calvary, shed his life's blood for us, and we thank you. We love you, we honor you, and we give you praise for it. But Lord, we want to walk and be led by the Spirit. We want to attain the law of righteousness in our life.
We want to take off the code of self-righteousness. We want to love the lost, love the sinner, but hate the sin. We want to bring them in through the love of God. Lord, I love you and I honor you. And I pray right now a special prayer over each and every person that's here. Lord, I anoint them to be soul winners in this life. So many times we get distracted. Our calling, what we should be doing is winning souls and furthering the kingdom of God. Lord, we want to uh, glorify your name. We want to bring heaven down to earth during these last days where a lost and dying world will see the serenity and peace of being a child of the living God. Lord, we want to bring deliverance to those that are in addiction. We want to bring peace to those that suffer with depression. We want to bring healing to those that have physical ailments. But first and foremost, Lord, we want to introduce them to the King and King and Lord of Lords. We want their spiritual experience to be the greatest experience in their life. And that cannot happen unless we introduce them to the man that died on the cross and shed his blood. Lord, we love you. Give us the desire. Give us the zeal. As we close this service out on a Wednesday night, give us that desire and zeal to win somebody for you. And Lord, I know some of us are going to go to bed tonight. We're going to condemn ourselves for the failures that we've had in the past with not showing the love of Christ at times. But Lord, if we'll just ask, you said you're just and fair. You'll forgive us of that. Start us a new path. And you said you will give us something in the morning that we don't deserve when we wake up to walk in it. And that's your mercy. And Lord, I thank you for that. I thank you for your mercy. I thank you for your love. And where I fail today, I pray that you would strengthen me to be better tomorrow. And where I fail tomorrow, I pray, pray that the following day, you're already in my future. You're already preparing things for that, that you've already got a way for me to walk, and it's righteousness and holiness. And I pray right now that you will undergird us with the power of the Holy Spirit and overshadow us with the love of God as we go into a lost and dying world. Lord, I pray not to build a number, for the Abbeville Church of God. But that a name would be written in the Lamb's Book of Life and have eternal security in the Creator of all things, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Lord, I pray we would do your will in the days to come and introduce somebody to you. We love you, we honor you, and we give you glory in Jesus' wonderful name. Amen and amen. Thank you so much for being here. Greet somebody or love on somebody. Tell them you love them and tell them let's go win this world for Jesus.